webinar all about community solar gardens and whether or not it's a good opportunity for your local government to subscribe. Um, my name is Dan Thede and I'm the communications manager with the Clean Energy Resource Team. Um, I won't be doing much except making sure that the technology runs smoothly. Um, but I did want to let you all know that um, if you do have any questions um, throughout the presentation, you can just use the little Q&A uh, or chat boxes and um, let us know about those and we'll answer them as we go. And um, if we do not get to your question, then we'll do our best to follow up afterwards as well. Um, we're recording this webinar so that um, we can share it with you and others afterwards. And um, so you'll be getting that. And then we're also going to send the PowerPoint slides we used uh, today. So no need to take frantic notes. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and pass it off to Lisa Paulus, who will um, take you into the beginning of this here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'll, I'll admit right off the bat that this is one hour <laughs> of a presentation and we're going to fly through a lot of things and I think our intent is to try to cover as many of the basics as we can. We'll try to hit on things a couple of different times so that if you see it and you're like, wait, what did they say? Uh, rest assured that we'll probably get back to it again. Um, but also, as Dan mentioned, feel free to ask your questions. Um, hold on. Sorry, guys. I'm trying. Here we go. Here's our quick 30-second um, CERT advertisement. CERT stands for the Clean Energy Resource Teams, and we're a statewide partnership um, that works in collaboration with four different partner organizations. Um, I am based at the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships here at the University of Minnesota Extension, as are Dan and Pete Lindstrom, um, and Trevor Drake, who is also presenting with us today, is based at the Great Plains Institute. Um, as many of you know well, our mission is to connect individuals and their communities to the resources that they need to both identify and implement community-based clean energy projects. And a lot of what we do is sessions like this to help you go into a decision knowing what the choice is that you're making and feeling like you can make an informed one. So here's what we're going to cover today. I'm going to start us off doing a community solar garden overview. Trevor is going to talk in more detail about subscription pricing and sort of what you ought to be looking for. Pete's going to go into other contracting terms and things that you should note. And we'll do a quick recap at the end of some resources and tools. Um, the website that you see down here on the bottom right, mncerts.org forward slash solar gardens is where we have all sorts of solar garden tools and resources. And if you ever have questions, we encourage you to go there and check that out. And just to reiterate, honestly, any questions that you have as you go, please, please share them. So we often start as we talk about community shared solar or community solar gardens, those terms are synonymous with this sort of Cliff Notes version. And we call it the Cliff Notes because it really is the sort of example of here's one big solar array and this could be all of the different subscribers, subscribers who participate in this solar garden array. They don't need to have it on their own roof or on their own property, but they still receive the benefit from the solar system through a credit. And they're able to participate whether or not they had a good solar resource on their own property or had the sort of financial wherewithal to put a system up on their own facility. More formally, the definition as written into statute is that it's essentially located solar photovoltaic or PV system that provides electricity to participating subscribers. And you see what I had just described on the previous slide depicted here. You know, one, solar panels are installed in a sunny location. That may seem like an obvious point, but that's an important, you know, <laughs> added benefit that you get with the solar garden is that you can optimize where you're putting them to be in that sunny location. And then individual entities, which could be, as many of you are, a local government entity, but it could be businesses, it could be residents, can subscribe and cover their energy usage through this garden. And then they get a credit on their utility bill for their portion of the garden's output, sort of their allocation's output. And we'll get back to that word allocation as we go. We're hosting this session today largely focused on the Excel Energy program rules for solar gardens. Now, many of you may have heard of other solar garden programs. Many of Minnesota's cooperative utilities also have solar garden programs. And if you're in one of those territories, those are also really great programs to look into. 
We're talking about this one today because it's a little bit more nuanced because it's inviting another entity into the sort of energy business with you by working with a garden operator or developer. And so we're hoping to work through some of those details, but here are in general, the program rules defined in statute that cover Excel Energy's solar garden program. So many of you have already been approached about being subscribers. And the number one rule to think about as a subscriber is that this is designed to cover your energy and electricity usage. So you may cover up to 120% of your annual electricity usage. And you would actually verify this at the outset by looking back at your past two years of energy bills. And you can get that average then of how much you've used. And then the rule says up to 120% because there's this understanding that it's possible that you might use more or less energy on any given year based on various circumstances. The other real important rule to note as a subscriber is that you must subscribe to a garden that is either in the same county in which you are located, so like Renville County, or an adjacent county. So if you are in Renville, you could, could sub subscribe to a garden in Candy, Ojai, Meeker, McLeod, Sibley, Nicolette, Brown, Redwood, Yellow Medicine, or Chippewa. <laughs> so you have a lot of options, but it has to be one right next door. And that's in part, I think, to just reinforce this idea of a community solar garden. It's one near you. The rules for gardens themselves, and these are the rules that um, the developers or operators would need to abide by, are that the maximum size of a single garden can be one megawatt. For those of you who have been maybe approached about leasing your land for a, a garden, you know, that's about five, or five to eight acres. There are a series of gardens that were initially proposed that can be co-located up to five megawatts. So it would be five one megawatt gardens. Any new gardens that are proposed at this point have to stay under that one megawatt size limit. But there's no limit overall to the number of gardens that could move forward. Um, and that means that it's an opportunity from now and in a continuing way for more gardens to be cited. Each and every garden has to have five, five subscribers at a minimum. So that could be five different local government entities. That could be a local government entity and four businesses. That could be four residential customers. That'd be a pretty small garden, but <laughs> all of that is possible. And no individual garden can have the output from that garden allocated, uh, sorry, more than 40% of that garden's output allocated to one subscriber. So this is essentially trying to make sure that there isn't just one entity that takes 90% of it, and then you distribute the rest over little pockets. Trying to make sure that the load is spread out across subscribers as well. When we asked all of you as you were registering if you had been approached, um, one of the things that we heard from many of you is, uh-huh, I've been approached at least once, maybe twice. And, and I get a lot of questions from folks about why is somebody approaching us as a local government? Why, you know, why are we looked at as this good subscriber? And I will say that in general, this is often referred to as local governments make good, what are called anchor tenants. So if you think about a shopping mall, um, you think about the sort of Macy's in the corner or the Sears in the corner. These are, you know, long-term businesses that have been around. And as a shopping mall, you want to have this anchor, the thing that you know is going to be there. People are going to come to the mall to go shopping there. The same is sort of true for a local government on a solar garden. Local governments are stable and secure customers. You are not terribly likely to move. You're not terribly likely to go out of business. You have good credit. You're likely to pay your bills on time. And you have, you know, slightly larger loads or certainly larger loads than compared with a number of residential customers. And so if you participate in a garden, you can take on more energy than one might be able to take on at that residential level. And that saves the developer in terms of having to market the garden to a number of different options. how the program works. And, and I see, I'm seeing that there are a couple of questions that are coming in even related to sort of a local co-op. So I'll, I'll try to mention that as I go here. So in Excel Energy's program, I would say just think of it as a triangle and you are the subscriber. So you're over here on the right-hand side in green 
and you maintain the relationship that you've always had with XL Energy, your utility. You're still buying your power from them. You still have that ongoing relationship. And now you also have a new relationship with this garden operator or this garden developer. The garden operator or developer is the entity that is responsible for running the garden, making sure it's operating, making sure that Excel knows that you're subscribing, making sure that Excel knows how much the garden's output is, and that then Excel can give you the credit. But you now have two different financial relationships, and it's these sorts of green and red arrows that we're gonna address as we move forward, as we think about sort of how does the garden actually work. For those who are in co-op territory, you really have to have a utility that has a program that they're offering to be able to do this. So if your co-op doesn't yet have one, you know, I, we certainly encourage you to go and talk to them about your interest, but it's really a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the subscriber and the utility. There isn't this sort of third-party operator relationship. One of the questions that we get a lot, and this may be one that you all actually have in your head right now, <laughs> is how much does it cost? And that really is a function of both those green and red arrows. So I mentioned, you've got this relationship, we'll go back just for a second here. So you, you have an existing relationship with the utility and that green arrow refers to whoop, um, this bill credit rate. So this rate, and we're gonna talk about this a bit more, is set annually by the Public Utilities Commission and that determines the amount that will be multiplied by the output of the garden and then will show up as a credit on your bill. On this other side is the subscription rate and that's how much you pay that developer or operator as explained in your subscription agreement contract. So let's look at this left-hand side of the equation first, this bill credit rate. How is that determined and what do those prices look like? So, sorry to overwhelm you with the table, um, <laughs> but this is the 2016 bill credit rate. Now, most of you in a local government are gonna be in either this category called small general service or the category of general service. And small general service it's probably for a smaller facility, maybe a smaller city hall or that sort of thing. And a general service might be for somebody that has, you know, a hockey arena or somebody that's paying a demand charge might fall into that category. And these applicable retail rates have been updated annually. And that's the sort of starting standard rate. And it's often referred to as the ARR. So if you see that anywhere, that's what that's referring to, this applicable retail rate. And these are calculated based on energy costs in these three classes of customers. And then in many instances, you'll also be receiving what's called a REC payment, a renewable energy credit payment. And there are two different REC payment amounts. One is two cents for larger gardens, those over 250 kilowatts, and one is for smaller gardens, smaller than 250 kilowatts. But many of you are probably looking at this area. And just to to br briefly mention RECs, many of you may be thinking, why do I even need to know that? A REC is essentially the sort of greenness, which is why I have this tacky green box behind the lettering, um, the green attribute um, of the energy. So energy that's produced, you know, the grid doesn't care what kind of energy it is, the energy just flows to where it's needed. But in this instance, because XL Energy has renewable energy requirements, it cares about the RECs because that's what it uses to count for those renewable energy requirements. And these can actually be certified. So this is an example of Trevor's Renewable Energy Certificate. And, and what it shows is that these attributes are reserved for a certain person. Someone has purchased these attributes and then retires them to know that they get that sort of green or environmental benefit from that power. And that matters simply because it also means that there are some things that you can claim when you're part of a solar garden if you've sold direct and some things that you can't. So, if you, have, if you own the REC, you can say we use renewable energy, but in most of these instances, you have sold the REC. And so you can certainly say that we have subscribed to a solar garden, we've contributed to solar development, that sort of thing, but you can't say that you use solar energy because you've actually sold that sort of green energy attribute. Now, for most of you, that may sort of seem like splitting hairs, um, but there are some important things in your contracts that will actually refer to this. And if, if one of your goals in the process of doing a community solar garden is to be able to say, our city is 100% renewably energy powered, this may not be the right option for you. And if you have more questions about that, 
feel free to mention them in the chat box or even or follow up with us afterward. Okay, so we've talked about this sort of left side of the equation and this bill credit rate and how that's determined, but now we're going to get over here into the subscription rate side. This is what is set by the developer in your subscription agreement contract. And for most of you, you're going to see a pay-as-you-go plan, as they're called. There are also pay-upfront plans as a local government. That's probably not what you're going to be offered. And a pay-as-you-go is just as it sounds. Um, every month, you're going to be essentially paying two different bills now. You're going to be paying one to the garden operator developer and one to the utility. But the utility bill that following month will also include a credit for how much the garden produced in the previous month to sort of balance that out. And that's what you see here is the sort of you get your credit and you're making your payment every month over the 25 year of the contract. And most of these contracts that you would be signing up for are 25 years and you'll just continue to pay for that energy as you go. One of the things that we encourage people to take a look at is mentioned down here on the left that ideally your monthly payment that you're paying to the developer will be tied to the production of the garden. So that if the garden's not producing, you're not paying, and that lessens your risk in the situation. There are also, when you look at pay-as-you-go pricing, two common pricing structures. So the first one is what we call an escalator. That's the top two, and the bottom is called a discount. Now, just to give you a quick example, it could be that when you initially sign up, maybe you're paying 10 cents per kilowatt hour generated to the garden developer. And maybe there's a flat rate where they say it will always be 10 cents each and every month from now until the end of the 25 years. That's unlikely. Um, you know, some bigger local government subscribers may have a bit of market power to be able to negotiate for that, but that's not terribly likely. For the most part, what you might be seeing is what we call a rate with an escalator that might be, say, a 2% escalator. What you want to make sure is that the escalator that you're looking at is less than the average escalator of utility prices so that you're always going to be looking at some sort of benefit. And I think Trevor will get into that a bit more. The other common pay-as-you-go pricing model is a discount value. So it could be that the developer or operator will base what you pay them based on the bill credit that you get from Xcel Energy. So they might say, if you're always going to get um, the ARR plus that REC, whatever that might be, we will always have you pay us, maybe it's 3% less than that credit, or maybe it's 5% less. Or they might say, you will always pay us one cent less than what you get in terms of the bill credit. And that, that's called a discount, and it means you will lock in what you know those savings will be just in relation to the credit. And in these, in that sort of example, you have this, again, on the left-hand side, this bill credit rate, which, again, is set by the Public Utilities Commission, and say that might be 11 cents. And you have a subscription rate, say, in your contract with the developer, that's 10 cents. And to understand what your yearly cost or savings would be, you would multiply the number of kilowatt hours produced from your allocation by the bill credit rate minus the subscription rate. So in this instance, it would be the number of kilowatt hours produced times one cent. And that would give you a cent for how much you'd be saving. That was our lightning fast overview of community solar gardens. Oh, I had one other question. Oh, what happens to a developer or operator if a subscriber fails, fails to fulfill his or her contract? Um, well, there are lots of provisions in the contract for that very thing, and and you'll be in breach of contract, and you know the developer can then go after you um, as the subscriber who doesn't pay. Um, Pete Lindstrom will talk about this a bit more. I mean, there are provisions also for what if a developer or operator sold to a different company or or that sort of thing. And those are things that we'll talk about, but those are things that are important to consider and understand what those terms in the contract actually are so you know what you're getting into as you go. Um, just one final quick note there, um, the Public Utilities Commission docket for the Community Solar Garden Program is 13-867. 
And for many of you, you're not sure why I even bothered to put this up here, but this has been a program that's been discussed a lot at the Public Utilities Commission. And if you're ever wondering sort of the current status of what's going on in the program, looking at that docket can be a helpful place to look. Um, there was a big session last week at the Public Utilities Commission in which it looks like um, the commission is going to issue an order later this fall that will, down the road, rather than this um, average retail rate, the ARR plus a rec, they'll move to this value of solar rate. So that's just something to know. That's not for any gardens that have currently been proposed, but will apply to newer gardens or that next iteration of gardens. Okay, now on to subscription pricing. <laughs> Trevor, you're up. Great, thanks, Wisha. I am just gonna take a moment to make sure I have control of the application here. Excuse us, folks. We're just having a moment of technical difficulty. Wonderful. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Trevor Drake. As Lisa mentioned, I'm the Metro CERT co director and I work at the Great Plains Institute in Minneapolis. So, uh, we're going to talk about financial risk and savings, and uh, we've only got about 10 minutes to cover this, so it might be rather quick, but I want you to take a minute and imagine you've been asked by the Loon Lake City Council, of which you are a staff member, to look into solar garden subscriptions for the City Hall. And uh, so we're saying that the City Hall has a goal of eventually setting the, offsetting the building's energy use with 100% renewables. You've decided, uh, that in order to do this, you are gonna issue a request for proposals. So the city hall uses 100,000 kilowatt hours annually per year. You've put in this RFP that you only want pay as you go pricing, which Lisa talked about. Uh, and we've decided that we're actually willing to sell the RECs for better pricing. So as Lisa mentioned, we can say that we've contributed to solar development that is, is sort of equivalent to the amount of energy the city hall uses, but we can't say that the city hall will be solar powered if we sign up for one of these options. So we put out the request for proposals, a month goes by and here's what comes in. Fun in the Sun, a ca company from California is offering a subscription rate of $0.1395 per kilowatt hour. And that does not change, that is the same amount for the entire 25 year contract. The second proposal from Soleil eh, is a Canadian company offering $0.1220 per kilowatt hour, but that rate is going to increase by 1% each year. Lastly, Polar Solar from Northern Minnesota is offering a subscription and the rate will always be one cent less than the bill credit that you're receiving. So which option do you want? To help you decide, a member of your environmental commission offers to develop three models that conceptually represent these three offers. And here's what they've come up with. So in the first two models, your subscription rate is fixed. It's known over 25 years. So if the garden produces as expected, on average each year, you know right now what you'll pay in a given year. And that's represented by that red line. Uh, in the, and I should say, so the green line, uh, the green amount represents the bill credit rate. So again, Lisa mentioned that's set annually by the Public Utilities Commission. It's roughly equivalent to electricity rates in your customer class. And we generally think it will go up on average, uh, but it could vary from year to year. So I've drawn this to represent that. So going back to the first two models, in both of these, your potential savings is represented by the difference between the green and red lines. So you'll notice that it's also possible that at some point, electricity prices could go below your subscription rate, forcing you to pay more in a given year than you would without a solar garden subscription. But the idea is that over time, over the 25 year period, you are actually making more money uh, than you would otherwise. 
So let's look at the bottom model now, which is a little different. And this one, your subscription rate is variable because it will follow that bill credit rate. It's always one cent less. So you know that you will make one cent on every kilowatt hour produced by the garden. So looking at this, we've got this, uh, these three models and we conclude the following. In the first two, these fixed proposals, uh, we know that they provide predictable payment, but unpredictable savings. We don't know exactly how much we'll save in any given year, but we generally know how much we'll pay in year 15 or year 20 if the garden operates as expected. In the third model, uh, it provides predictable savings. So we know every year we'll save one cent per kilowatt hour produced by the garden, but we don't know what we're gonna pay to the developer in any given year. That depends on what the bill credit will be over time. So now the question is, what are the actual numbers behind these proposals? And to show this, what I'm gonna do is pull up the CERTS uh, calculator. We have two calculators available on our website. One allows you to look at just an individual proposal, and the second allows you to look at multiple proposals. So we're gonna pull up the second of those, which allows us to look at multiple proposals. And I'm gonna make sure that I can uh, control this. Looks like I can. Great. So I don't have time to walk through every item in this calculator, but we're just gonna cover some of the basics and, and show you what you can get out of it. So in the first table, which I'm scrolling up to now, uh, we provide inputs that will be true across all of the proposals. So we've put in 100,000 kilowatt hours per year for the city hall. Uh, we've decided that our uh, bill credit rate, or we've looked up and, and know that our bill credit rate is gonna be 0 0.0974 uh, cents. Uh, our rec is two cents. That's, uh, that's on top of the bill credit rate. And then this blue box, uh, CERTS has put this in there and we're saying that 3.5% is how much electricity prices in Excel territory have increased uh, from 2000 to 2014. In the green box, we can say how much we think electricity prices will go up over time. So you're allowed to enter a number in the green box. For this, it's rather conservative. And, and Dan, I'm wondering if you might, I can't get that hint box to go away. Could you click in a blank cell so that folks can see what this, in a, there we go, thank you. Um, and then in the last box is uh, you can enter a discount rate. So I've put in 4% and this is basically saying that money tomorrow will not be as valuable as money today and we're discounting it by 4%. If you don't know what to use, uh, you could always put in zero that will give you simple savings or you could ask your entity's financial professional. So the second table is just gonna give us some information about the size of the garden. And I apologize that these hint boxes are showing up we don't seem to be able to get them to go away uh, in, in this particular format, but when you open it up yourself, it will, it'll be easier to read. Uh, in this third table, I've entered in the information from these three proposals, just as they were on the other screen. So now we're looking at the results. So this table shows monthly advantage or disadvantage over 25 years. And what this is showing is the amount you can expect to save in a given month as a result of subscribing to one of these solar gardens or one of these proposals. So you can see that for the first one, Fun in the Sun, on year five per month, you're actually paying $83. Uh, you're not saving that. In all the other ones, you're saving some amount per month. Um, and you can see it's quite a bit less per month for polar solar than it is for the other two. So that's monthly. Now we're gonna go down to Cumulative, so this is taking how much you will likely have saved or spent uh, at a given point in time throughout the term. So if we look all the way to the right, savings after 25 years, we can see that in all three cases, uh, we have saved some amount of money over 25 years. We've been better off than if we hadn't subscribed to this in the first place. However, we can see that for fun in the sun, we're actually losing money for the first 15 years uh, and then that's made up later on. Uh, for Soleil A, we lose money initially and then are making money. And for Polar Solar, uh, which matches that model, it's always discounted off the bill credit rate, we're always making money. Uh, lastly, we will go down to a graph that will show us, 
this represented over time. So the blue line is, uh, it represents the bill credit rate at a 3.5% increase. This is based on Excel's historical average. The green line represents what we put in, 2.5% increase for that bill credit rate. The red line is the subscription for Fun in the Sun. The purple is for Soleil A, and the orange is for Polar Solar. So you can see that for Fun in the Sun, that subscription amount is staying roughly the same for 25 years. For Soleil A, uh, it is increasing according to that 1% escalator. And for Polar Solar, it is parallel to the bill credit rate that we put in. And the last thing I want to do, just to give you a sense for how the bill credit does change things, um, you'll recall that, I should go down. So if we look at the savings after 25 years, we've got about 9,000 for the first, 17,000 for the second, and 15,000 for the third. I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna change the bill credit rate to be 3.5% to match that Excel rate. And now I'll go back down to look at savings over 25 years. And you'll see a, there's been quite a big difference here. So now we're at 32, 39, and the third is still the same amount. It's still at 15,000. So this reflects how um, in the first two, your savings really are variable depending on what the bill credit rate does over time. And again, that's tied to electricity prices. In the third, your savings are known over 25 years. They really won't change depending on what the bill credit rate does. So now I'll go back to the PowerPoint slide. And Dan, if you could help me do that, it'd be gracious. Thanks. Um, and the last thing I wanna mention is just the opportunity cost. So one of the things to think about is uh, if you don't do this, what might you do instead? And uh, people often bring up a question, well, are there better offers out there? Yes, I'm sure there may be better offers that you could get. So that's something to consider. Uh, is it worth taking what you got in an RFP that you put out? Do you wanna put out another RFP to look for better offers? Or do you feel like you've gotten a good deal? Another consideration is that the technology will likely improve. So uh, you could get in now and begin saving. You could wait and sort of make a gamble thinking that the technology might improve. Um, one of the things that Lisa mentioned is that the program design is likely to change. So that's something to consider in deciding whether you want to get in now or wait. And it's not necessarily clear whether, whether it will change for the better or worse. I think that's true for all of these. And then lastly, in this program, you're committing a certain amount of your electricity load in a public building to one of these programs. And so it may be in the future that once you've committed that load somewhere, you can't double up. You can't sort of double dip that load into a different program. And it's possible new programs will come around. So that's just something to consider. I generally think that if you see something that you think is a good deal, you should probably get in if it meets your goals. Uh, but if it doesn't meet your goals, maybe it's worth waiting. So lastly, um, I want to mention that these are actual proposals that local governments have signed up for in the past six months. So these, these do represent what is available right now in the market. And pricing is not the only story. It's not the only thing to consider. So we are going to turn this over to Peter Lindstrom, who is going to talk about considerations in contract language beyond pricing. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Peter Lindstrom, and I'm the local government outreach coordinator for the clean energy resource teams. I am not an attorney. Uh, however, I did talk to a whole bunch of them uh, while preparing for this presentation and and uh, folks that are experts in, in subscriber agreements. And I've had the pleasure of signing a subscriber agreement for my city. I'm also the mayor of the city of Falcon Heights. So, one um, uh, so one thing that's uh, quite uh, crystal clear 
is that you will not find a perfect agreement. Uh, it does not exist either for the developer or the subscriber. And uh, one, one just a quick anecdote about that is the Met Council sent out a RFP for community solar last year. They received, I believe it was five responses to that RFP, five different companies. The Met Council rejected all five. Uh, the Met Council counter offered with their own subscription agreement and that was rejected by all five of the companies and it took a, about five months maybe six months of negotiation uh, to get to uh, subscription agreements that both sides could live with so what i'm going to do in the next few minutes is just go through some common themes uh, common aspects of the contracts of the subscription agreements and, and perhaps uh, some pitfalls to keep your eye out for. Uh, as Alyssa may have mentioned, these are 25 year terms, um, 25 years. I know that gives a little bit of heartburn for some uh, elected officials and, and perhaps some, um, some staff as well. And, and uh, the reason it's 25 years is because that's the amount of time that the developers are, are signing their contracts with Excel. Uh, and, it, and they are 25 years, no matter uh, what, what developer you're talking to. Um, operation of facility, uh, the, the subscription agreement's gonna spell out that the owner sh or the developer shall maintain that facility in good working order at all times with the intent to maximize the, the total number of credits. Allocation. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, this is the amount that you're subscribing to. Is it 1% of the garden, 5%, 10%? And uh, no one subscriber can be more than 40%. Price and payment, these are simply the things that uh, Trevor just outlined in that subscription agreement. The records and audit, some contracts are, and I think this is the best practice to keep in mind, some contracts, some, some subscription agreements uh, spell out that the owner shall provide reasonable evidence of the accuracy of the metering equipment and above and beyond that monthly reports about the energy produced by the facility. That subscription agreement is also going to cover taxes um, and spell out that uh, it's not the subscriber that's getting the investment tax credit. And if you do have to pay uh, sales tax, for example, that it's up to the subscriber to make those sales tax payments. Some of you may recall the bad old days when cities were required to pay sales taxes not that long ago. Uh, representations, warranties, and covenants. To me, it looks as a non-attorney, uh, like a lot of legal boilerplate about, um, about you are who you say you are and uh, that there's no litigation impacting this project, that sort of thing. Uh, a performance guarantee, oh, you know, on this representation, warranties and covenants, another important part is that uh, there's a pledge in there not to install any other distribution, uh, distributed generation resource under, the, under that account uh, that the community solar garden is under if that distributed generation resource exceeds 120% of the subscriber's average annual energy consumption. As Alyssa mentioned, that 120% number is, is quite important. Some contracts or subscription agreements call for a performance guarantee. Um, now, the, uh, uh, um, well, I'll just say that the contract that I'm most familiar with called for a performance guarantee uh, that guaranteed 90% of expected deliveries, uh, which is spelled out in the pro forma. Um, not every contract has a performance guarantee, so that's something that you're going to want to pay close attention to. Um, some developers will say, you know, you don't, you don't need one, you won't pay uh, if the array doesn't perform. But other people will say, you know, there's an opportunity cost here. Uh, we just spent five months, six months negotiating this contract. I want to make sure that it's going to be in good working order in the years to come. 
The contracts, uh, the uh, subscription agreement's also going to spell out the default and force majeure uh, components. Um, and it def it's going to define what a default is, failure to pay, failure to perform, and if the company declares bankruptcy, what happens in those situations. Remedies, limitations, and liability. Um, I'll, uh, and early termination, I'm going to dive into that, as well as assignment, um, dive into those aspects here in just a minute. And then, of course, it's going to have a miscellaneous component to the subscription agreement. So it'll say things like each entity is responsible for resolving any separate disputes with the utility. And it's going to spell out if there is a dispute uh, between the subscriber and the developer, how should that be taken care of? So what court, um, in what venue uh, is that going to take place? So um, as a subscriber, you for the most part, we'll want to make sure that it's going to be in a court in Minnesota and not in, say, California. You don't want to have to find yourself in a situation where you have to hire a city attorney um, in California. And then it's going to go into insurance and data practices, and I'll talk more about that in a minute as well. Termination. Wow. What if something goes wrong? What happens? I think there was a question about that. Um, so that's always a possibility. Um, some contracts spell out uh, kind of a short-term date, like if, uh, if there are interconnection issues with the utility, if the um, if there's a disqualification from the uh, utilities CSG program, or if the developer isn't to isn't able to get the financing that they need, or are if they're not able to get adequate subscriptions, there's a drop dead date. Um, the the date I saw for one particular contract was December 31st, 2017, um, where everybody can just go their separate ways. And uh, and nobody is nobody's liable. Well, what if the subscriber backs out? Um, what I've seen is pretty common: is uh, the subscriber owes that the unpaid monthly allocation payments due at the time of termination. So it's year 12 of that those 25 years, and for whatever reason, uh, the city just wants out. Um, they're on the hook. They're on the hook to pay the, those other 13 years um, that, of those, uh, those payments. And what if the developer fails to perform? Uh, well, this could happen for a variety of reasons. This could be just an outright breach of contract. Uh, it could be a force majeure situation, uh, which as you likely know, could be a, an act of God, a, a tornado rolls through the array, uh, a war, a crime. Um, that uh, subscription is, agreement is going to spell out what happens in in those cases. Um, if it's just an outright breach, uh, some contracts say, okay, well, you have 30 days to rectify that breach. And if that's impossible, it can be expanded up to 180 days. Um, if that doesn't happen, the developer is on the hook to pay damages to the subscriber. And, and if you look at a contract, you know, if you're a, uh, an individual or a family, um, they, they, they will have these early termination um, components, but they're, they'll have other things like, what if you get hit by a bus? Year 12, you, you die. What happens there? Um, what happens if your family, you and your family, move out of the utility territory? These are things um, that are less applicable to a city. Um, you know, if, uh, certainly if you're a city, you're, you're focused in on the early termination aspects. If you just want out at year 12, there could be other really unusual circumstances of what if you merge with another city or... 
What if the utility changes territory? Um, things that, that uh, you want to think about as well. Let me talk about assignment for a minute. Uh, assignment is simply the transfer of rights from one party to another. This is really important because, as you can imagine, uh, the company that you signed that 25-year ag agreement with, it could be sold. Um, and you, as a subscriber, want to make sure that, uh, that you have this subscription agreement with a reputable company. Um, and so, and so, uh, and so you really need to uh, clarify some of these questions and, and also um, assignment on the, on the subscribers end. So, um, so it would be a clear transfer if the city of Loon Lake, in Trevor's example, transferred its subscription to the city of Mosquito Heights. Okay, that would be a clear transfer. Um, but what if you transferred from the meter uh, uh, from your uh, uh, ice arena to City Hall? And would that constitute um, uh, an assignment transfer? And, and it's important because oftentimes there are fees associated with the transfer. So we've seen it range from $750 fee to upwards of $5,000 or so that you could be on the hook to pay. Data practices, this is an interesting question. As, as those in government know, all government data is open to the public um, unless there are sp specific exclusions. And um, intellectual property is one of those exclusions. Uh, some developers will say, hey, this this subscription agreement is intellectual property and is therefore should be qualified as or classified as private data. Um, from what I've heard, the, uh, that that is not being upheld. That uh, uh, it 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 should be considered public data, and this is this is of course beneficial to subscribers, local government subscribers, because you want to know what the deal is for other cities, um, cities, counties, schools. Uh, you want to avoid that that airline scenario where uh, all the different passengers are paying different rates. Um, uh, that's not in your best interest. So um, so I think I think we can move forward understanding that it's public data. I had a great conversation with Chris Smith, who's a risk attorney with the League of Minnesota Cities. And these are a few recommendations that Mr. Smith is recommending. First of all, uh, the League, they're looking for at least a million dollars in commercial general liability. They would prefer two million, but they definitely want to see one million. They want to see the city endorsed as an, ad as an additional insured. They want to see that uh, you're fully indemnified. Um, they get a little uh, nervous when they see that the company is self-insured. They really want to know that the, the, uh, that, that the uh, company has the horsepower um, to back it up um, in case things go awry. And they're not big fans of binding arbitration. Just as expensive as going to court, and uh, according to the league, oftentimes the results are less favorable. Uh, and they're looking for any sort of limitations on liability. Uh, and, you know, some agreements limit liability to a certain dollar amount, and other contracts have uh, a formula, um, which could be substantially less than the damages suffered by the city. So that's a, a good thing to keep an eye on. And basically, they're just looking for any other limits to damages. Perhaps the most important thing I'll say is if you have further questions, be sure to uh, call us, call me. There's my number uh, at the bottom, Peter Lindstrom with the Clean Energy Resource Teams. But I've received the thumbs up for any city, any local government to contact the 
uh, individuals listed here. Jason Willett with the Met Council, uh, he's the one that did the negotiations with these five different developers and uh, has a, a lot to say about that. Uh, Brian Milberg from the city of Minneapolis and of course Chris Smith from the League of Minnesota Cities. That's all I have and I believe I'm turning it back to Lissa for a wrap up. Thanks Pete and thanks Trevor both very much. Um, I think honestly at this point we mostly want to be able to take some of your questions um, I thought that there were a couple that were coming in via chat. I'm sorry that I, I missed some of those um, as they came in the chat window instead of the Q&A box. I was looking at the wrong spot. Um, so one of them that came in earlier was, were these the rules just for the Excel program or are these all programs? And these are the rules that I presented much earlier are really ju just those for the Excel program. Um, Co-ops are not regulated and can therefore set, you know, many of their own rules for how that program will work in terms of like how big and how much of somebody can subscribe to that kind of thing. There was also a question about um, who sets the bill credit rates that we showed earlier and those are set by the Public Utilities Commission annually and so those will get updated again in 2017 for that new average retail rate. Um, there was a question that came in about what if a subscription rate is higher than the bill credit rate. Um, you know, you should look very closely at any proposal. Trevor, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that one. Yeah, I'll just say, and let me make sure my mic is going now. Okay. Uh, I'll just say, it, I think it depends on what the, the full 25 year, um, scenario looks like. So if you're starting out with a subscription rate that is higher than the current bill credit rate, uh, if it's only slightly higher and if that subscription rate is going to stay flat for 25 years, it's possible that that could actually be a good proposal. Uh, if that starts, if your subscription rate starts above the bill credit rate and has an escalator built in, it's possible that it's a pretty bad proposal. And in what happens in that case is that you would pay more uh, than if you hadn't subscribed in the first place. You'd be paying more. Now, if you are keeping the renewable energy credits uh, on your own behalf, you actually may have a scenario where you're paying more than you would have otherwise, and the benefit that you're getting is being able to say that you're 100% renewably powered. If you don't get to keep the RECs and you're paying more than you would have otherwise, I would question that proposal. And perhaps then in a related question was, what about the greenhouse gas emission or CO2 emission reductions? Can you claim those? Should I take this one? Yeah. Uh, it depends on whether you have you own those renewable energy credits. So if you own the renewable energy credits, what's happening is on the back end, uh, the solar garden developer is actually saying buy from one garden to the next, not, not per individual subscription, but garden by garden, whether the credits are to be kept or to be sold to Excel. If they're sold to Excel, the subscribers get that additional two or three cents on top of the bill credit rate. If they are kept, then what would likely happen is the developer would uh, retire those renewable energy credits on behalf of the subscribers. And retiring means then that you can claim all of the benefits that your produced renewable energy has over an equivalent amount of fossil fuel produced energy. And that would include the carbon reductions. Mm -hmm. If folks are wondering, you can see this middle, top middle item here. I think that you can see me mousing over it. That question subscribers can ask of operators. If you, these are a number of resources that are on our search website, that mnsearch.org forward slash solar garden. And on the second page, it shows that full table that we talked about earlier. And we keep it updated as those um, rates are changed. So you can always see what that current rate is. But that would be a good reference point for you to look at as well as you're seeing proposals from developers and operators. So you can compare the number that they're showing to the one that should be there. Um, this item on the right is tips for subscribers. And it talks about the difference between that escalator and discount rate. Um, and the calculator tool, that subscriber financial decision tool, is also available on the web. I know a number of you 
have actually asked, are we going to, can we make sure that we get <laughs> that Excel spreadsheet? And absolutely, we'll um, be sending that out to everybody afterwards so you can do some of your own playing with that. So one of the other questions that came in would be, is there a chance that you would ever be paid out cash for anything or just credits? So that's a good question. Um, it, it may be that over the period of a year, if your subscription generated more credits, um, then averaged out your bill, they might, Excel might cut you a check at the end of the year for that excess. That's the only time that you would be paid out cash. Um, I mean, the idea with the 120% rule is that that wouldn't happen very often, um, that you would, you would really just be getting that credit on your bill and maybe it could get your bill to zero, but it, it wouldn't be that they'd have to, to send you a check, but that is a possibility. Um, there was a question about what happens after 25 years. <laughs> Does the solar garden keep going? Do you enter into a new contract? Um, at the end of 25 years, you know, there would be options. So it might be if the garden was still producing and there, you know, wasn't better technology, maybe somebody would want to re-up a contract or they might want to rebuild and put new panels on or, or something like that. I think for somebody who's even thinking about serving as a host site, one of the things you want to be clear about is what does happen at the end of 25 years and that there's a plan for that. But as a, as a subscriber, you may or may not get an offer at the end of 25 years, but there's nothing that's con known in a concrete way at this point about what will happen then. Oh, and there's a question more about size. We have someone building a five megawatt solar garden on 71 acres. Why can this be bigger than what you have on PowerPoint? That is a really good question. Um, I mean, it's an earlier project, but if you did the sort of five megawatt times eight acre, that could be 40 acres. So 71 does seem a bit big. Um, I mean, it may be that they couldn't get it in um, like one big rectangle and maybe it ended up being bigger because of how they were having to do the siting, might have had to be because of where a substation was or something like that. But honestly, I think that that might be a good question to follow up on. I mean, five to eight acres is a rule of thumb, but that would be quite big. Any other questions that folks have? Um, one other just thing I'll quickly point out for those of you who have been approached about a garden and want to sort of check out the company um, that has approached you or are looking to maybe, as Trevor mentioned, issue a request for proposal on our Clean Energy Project Builder website, we actually list all of the different companies who are doing solar gardens in Minnesota. Um, this list the co-ops as well as these private developers who are doing gardens um, and you could actually go through and get a sense for sort of who are those different companies and it might even give you a sense for if you wanted to issue an RFP are there a couple that you wanted to reach out to and, and how would you find them are there any other questions that folks have Okay, well, barring any additional questions, thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everyone who participated today. I think Pete said earlier, you know, he is happy to be a resource for all of you as you're looking into these contracts and trying to get a handle on them. He really is a good resource as are the other folks that he listed. Trevor has done an amazing job pulling together lots of different details. Trevor was part of that local government subscriber collaborative effort and helped folks who were looking at different proposals really try to understand how do the numbers shake out for me and what does that look like? And he is a great resource as you're thinking about that. And I too am happy, you know, for anyone that has questions is trying to understand where do we go from here? We really are happy to walk through that with folks. And please, I mean, don't hesitate to call us that is what we're here to do, is to help you get answers to your questions and make sure that you're feeling like this is a good choice that you're making as you move forward. Thank you so much. And this is Dan. Um, I'm just letting you know one more time, in case you came in late, that um, if you registered for the webinar here, we'll be sharing the recording out with everyone, as well as the presentation. And 
This is a new version that Trevor used of our calculator tool. There's a simple one on our website where you can punch in some, uh, some basic information for just one garden, but as you probably noticed, this was more of a comparison tool, and um, we'll be sharing that with everyone as well. So again, cheers, thanks for joining us, and um, excited to help you continue to explore this as we move forward.